Alright, now we gather here, brothers and sisters, on this special day for the National Day Against Police Brutality in 10 2017 in Newark, New Jersey. Yes. And I want you to stand that we all appreciate it here. We have a lot of family members here. And before I get through speaking, the family members just want you to know that what you are going through now, you're not alone. You have extended family here. That's why we all gather here together for our loved ones. And as I call the family members to come up to speak, we try to get time for everyone to speak so we allow two, three minutes and so we can keep this moving, every, every, keep this thing going on. Uh, first, I'm going to call up the mother of Jerome Reed that was murdered yeah. down in Bristol, New Jersey by the hands of police when he was unarmed. And now you can go on YouTube and pull it up, Jerome Reed, and you can see for yourself. But right now, I want the mother here to speak and give her time. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Power to the people. Power to the people. I don't hear everybody. Power to the people. That's very, that's much, much better. My name is Sheila Reed. I'm the mother of Jerome Reed. This is my son, Jerome Reed. He was murdered in Bridgeton, Bridgeton, New Jersey, by the police officers, um, Baheem Days and Ro Roger Worley. This is Baheem Days on my, right, on my left. This is Roger Worley on my right. They shot my son. Roger Worley shot once through the car. Baheem Day shot seven times to my son's body. Seven to the body, six to the body, once to the head. They, the police assumed that they stopped them for a rolling stop at the stop sign on Henry Street. They did not do. A, they did a rolling stop. I know a lot of you do rolling stop. Nobody does a complete stop at a stop sign. If you do. You're telling the tale, and it's Sunday, and I don't want to stand by you. But anywho, he asked the driver for his license and registration. The driver said he had his license and registration. The driver opened up the glove compartment. There was a gun. Officer Day says, gun, gun, gun. He told um, Officer Wally to get him out the car. My son had his hands up above his shoulders. He tried to get out the car. Days wouldn't allow him out the car. He kept pushing his hands back into the window because he was going to hang him out the window, let him know he has nothing in his hands. He said, if you reach for something, I'm going to effing kill you. And he told Roger, he's reaching, he's reaching. And what he was reaching for was the door to get out the car. So when he got out the car with his hands up, Officer Day shot him down like a dog. He did, they found him not guilty. The man is guilty as hell, and we need to do something about it. And the funny part about it is that Officer Days was in two other counties before he got to Bridgeton for excessive force. And they allow him to work in Bridgeton. And this time he murdered someone, and he's re and they got him, gave him his retirement. They said he was uh, uh, physically d disturbed and all this other stuff. Which is bull. Wasn't nothing wrong with Days. Days know my son like the back of my hand. So I'm here to talk to the mothers and, and um, help them with their, um, I'm a little nervous, with their little situations because I'm still hurting after three years. And I know some of you are still hurting longer than that. You're never going to get over it. That's with the babies that you birth, and you rather for him to bury you than you bury him or her. So this is what I have to say today. I do have more, but my time is limited. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, next, I want the mother and grandmother, Regina Ashford and Cecile Hepburn to come up here of Kashad Ashford. Hello, my name is Regina Ashford. I'm the mother of Kasha Ashford. My son was murdered September 16th. It's been three years, three hard years. My son was in a stolen car. I didn't know the job, the cops can be the judge and the jury. I wasn't supposed to go to the grave site to visit my son. I was supposed to go to a jail if he was wrong. But anyway, I'm still looking for justice for my son. I have got totally no answers. The answers that I got, I'm not happy with. They just telling me anything to throw me out, to get me out of here. But we took it to the Supreme Court. We won to get the videos. The videos they showed us had nothing to do with the chase with my son. They showed us three, they showed us two videos. The videos was cars that come into the scene after my son was dead. That's right. That's right. So where is the justice at? I still don't see justice for my son. I'm still looking, I'm still searching. I'm not giving up. The fight is on and it's going to continue. Don't wait until it happens to your family to get involved. It hurt. Sometime I want to give up. Then I say, I'm not giving up. I'm going to fight. My son not here to fight for his. I'm going to do it. But anyway, I'm here to let everybody know that this is a pain. This is painful. I don't want to see another mother that have to go through what I went through. I was too young to bury a child. And it hurt. It still hurt as I'm here today. I'm being strong because I usually break down. But I refuse to do it because it ain't getting me nowhere, but I'm going to fight for them. That's right. Thank you. All right. I am the grandmother of Kashad Ashford, Gina's mother in law. This has been a long journey. But a long journey, a lot of times, we feel like we're fighting by ourselves. Yes, there are some that come out, some that doesn't seem to want to be bothered. But at the rate we're going, this is going to knock on everyone's door. So if we don't get involved to make changes to the law, so that something changes, so that the police are either more careful and thoughtful before they pull the trigger, or they're accountable once they do the brutality and the killing. To not have any accountability is shame on America. Shame on America that we sit here as citizens, but yet and still, we have no accountability. You can kill our kids, and we just accept it. And whatever story you want to roll out, as Regina said, the cars that allegedly were chasing him, none of those have videos. The cops that allegedly shot him, they didn't have videos in their cars. The only videos we got to see was an after effect of police showing up at the scene afterwards. Well, who do we believe? Because we've seen enough cases where they put guns in people's cars, where they lie and then get caught later. But guess what? But even with the lies, they still do not go to jail. They can do what they want. We're either going to stand strong together and make some changes to the system that holds them accountable, or this shall knock on your door at some point. And God forbid, I do not wish it on anyone because the pain is tremendous. There's plenty of nights still. I feel like, where is my grandson? Oh no, he wasn't no, no angel, but he never hurt a soul. Never put his hands on nobody, never pulled the gun on nobody, never beat up nobody. I don't care who check it, who record check him, you will never find anything where he hurt someone. So to everybody, we got to stand strong, we got to get more people involved, because some law somewhere has got to change. Thank you. All right, I want to bring up next. Tawana Graham 
of Jaquille Graham. Is she here? Is a family member here? Okay. Up next, I want to bring up the mother. Gwen Benson, her son, was murdered down in Bristol, New Jersey. Dow LaRose Laquan Fuqua. Good afternoon, everybody. I am very, very nervous. Sorry, we got you back. We got you back. We got you back. This is my first time speaking. My son was shot three times in the back in broad daylight. February the 10th of this year. Running from the police. They chased him two blocks. At quarter to four in the afternoon, broad daylight. Two bullets hit him in the back. When that second bullet hit him, it turned him. And a third one went through the front of his chest. They, the police news reports say they found a gun in the vicinity. I need to let y'all know, I still haven't got the police reports yet. They still, the prosecutor's office and the police are still holding everything up. I came all the way from Bristol, but it matters to me. My son's life matters to me. He was my baby. He was 23 years old. He had no children. He had just won his first audition on New Jersey Got Talent for an ra inspiring rapper. You can go on his Facebook page, D. Rose. He was supposed to perform and go to the next level on February the 18th, and they killed him February the 10th. A mother is not supposed to bury her child. It kills me. I had good days, and I damn sure got bad. I need y'all prayers and support. They can't just keep killing our kids. You know, it hurts. It hurts. I need y'all support. Because like the other mother said, God knows you don't want this nightmare to knock at your door. Because this some, oh my God. I scream, I holler, I cry. I go through mood swings. I cuss my family out because it hurts. And I don't know how to deal with it anymore. They say it gets better in time. I feel like I'm going backwards. I'm serious. Just pray for me, and we need justice for our babies. Thank That's you. Right. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. We, we, we sister right here, sister. We all here for the same thing. We got love. We got your back. You got our support, and we stand by you 110%. Now, next, I want to bring up to the mic, Brother Ron Brown. Not Brown? Oh, excuse me. Oh. Where they at? The McDougal family. Oh, excuse me. You don't have the circle. Uh, I have the McDougal family here. I apologize that I have the McDougal here. For his son, Jason McDougal. Um, peace, brothers and sisters. Um, my name is TJ Whitaker, and I'm from the Mapso Freedom School. We want to give thanks to People's Organization for Progress for organizing today's rally. Um, Again, a very emotional day, um, just listening to all of the family speak. <clears throat> but I want to echo um, what Kashad Asper's uh, grandmother said. Um, we need to make some changes in the system. Um, the body cams, right, the civilian review boards that we are fighting for, which we desperately need, right, are a start. But we need to change this system, y'all. Um, I stand here with Cynthia McDougal and her son Jason 
on July 5th, 2016, Jason was assaulted by the Maplewood Police Department uh, after a 4th of July exhibit. Walking home, he and over 100 other young black students were herded out of Maplewood into Irvington because the police just didn't believe that they lived in Maplewood. When they finally got to the border of Maplewood in Irvington, Jason was tackled by a police officer. He was beaten and assaulted by six officers. A seventh officer came and kicked him in the head while the other six officers were beating him. But he did survive the encounter. The other families... By the grace of God, he survived the encounter. Right? Many of the other families here were not so fortunate. And our heart bleeds for those families. But Jason's ordeal isn't over as well. Uh, the trauma that he experienced that night, um, he still has to deal with and will deal with for the rest of his life. But they are now a part of this struggle. Um, I'm so glad that this family got a chance to meet the Ashfords and the Reeds. Um, we are continuing to do our work in Maplewood to bring more families, uh, more students into the struggle. We thank you again for the invitation. All power to the people. And pray for these families. Black Lives Matter. Let's give our sister a round of applause for her up here. No, you come back. All right, now bring it all back. How y'all doing? A lot of you know me and a lot of you don't. I haven't been out much, but... This is my grandson. He hasn't been mentioned before. He is the father, the son of my son, Jacquee Graham, that was beaten to death in East Orange Precinct over a three-day weekend. I'm not saying he was shot. It's not better. Dead is dead. But my son suffered over that whole three-day weekend to be found dead, so they say, in his cell six o'clock that morning. Pain is pain to lose a child, Lord Jesus. A physical, a mental, emotional pain is no other pain like it in this world. You lose your mother, your father, anybody, but there's no greater pain than to lose a child. And that was my oldest son. He would have been 29. He would have been 29 today. His birthday is March 11th, though. But as it goes on, he would have been 29. His son is eight years old. He was three months old when his father got killed. And I get so many questions. Grandma, what if? Did he read this? Did he do this? Did he do that? And I have so much to give, but... And he's taking it all in. Because he's an excellent reader like his father. Thank God. He's carrying his tree. He even looked like his father. And he sees his father friends, oh man, I'm gonna come get you, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Nobody gonna come do nothing. It's me, his mother and my older son, my younger son. But I appreciate everybody coming out. All the mothers that suffering, all the fathers that suffering from a loss, God be with you and bless you. Okay, before we go on the next speaker, is there any other family member here that has someone in their family has been brutalized by the police or killed? Benson, and um, 
last year the North Police murdered my nephew. And um What's his name? Naji Salam. And um we still fighting, we're gonna keep it going, but we haven't got any answers either. And I feel the people out here that lost a loved one. He wasn't my child, but I know the hurt and the pain of his mother and my brother, his father. Brother, no answers whatsoever. The prosecutor, nobody helped us out so far. But we still gonna fight for him, fight for justice, and power to the people. All right, next we're gonna bring up Brother Ron Brown. Say a few words. Thank you, power to the people. I, before I, I'm here, my son Ronnie, Ronnie Jr. was killed five years ago. He wasn't killed by the police, he was killed black on black crime. So I'm the Newark rep for the People's Organization for Progress and we just wanted to be known, I know the other groups out here, the same thing. That we are, you know, because people always ask, why are you saying the police killing? What about your own? We're against that too. We're against black on black crime. Now, let me say this. Every Monday, I'm over at the federal building with a group of people that are here now, and we speak about police brutality. So no one can say that I, you know, I'm here about my son Ronnie killed, but I speak every Monday about police brutality. About 55 years ago, a brother by the name of, we know him as Malcolm X, was asked by a conservative columnist about what's the difference between a police officer killing a black person and a black person killing a black person. And Brother Malcolm said, oh, there's a major difference. And the difference is this. A police officer takes an oath. He says that he will uphold law and order in the community that he is assigned to work. And that is a major difference. They're not sent there to kill, but to maintain and contain order in the community. So that's the difference between police brutality and black on black crime. And black on black crime, they may be arguing about drug money or anything, but police take a test, they take an oath. If you can't withhold the oath, don't take the test and don't take the job. Because we are human, like anyone else, and we deserve to be treated fairly. Thank you very much for letting me have a word. All right, next, I want to bring up a lady, co-chairwoman, Ingrid Hill of POP, People Organization for Progress. I not only want you to listen to her, but I want you to know that you heard what the former family that stand up here on this mic, what they had to say. And we feel this, each and every one of us. That's why we out here. Because I don't want you to show up and say, well, I went there and I heard that and they said that. No. We out here every day, especially on Monday in, federal, in front of the federal building for Justice Monday. We out here fighting because some laws has to be changed. There has to be accountability. There has to be something. Because we're not going to sit back too much longer. Now we're dealing with this. As mature, intelligent adults. But if you want, trust me, we'll bring the fight to you. Because that's what we do. We stand up for our rights. Alright, I ain't going to say any more. I'm going to bring Ingrid Hill up here. Give her a round of applause. Brothers and sisters, um, there are a lot of other people, women and men, who have been killed in the state of New Jersey. Okay, one of the things that we're trying to do is to focus, in addition to supporting people nationally, we need to also do house work here in New Jersey because we have had over 243 people killed by police in the state of New Jersey alone. 
I want to read some of the names um, because some of the families are not here. Some of the families have moved out. Some of the families have died. But I think it's important to at least read some of the names of people who have been involved that we have supported over the years. Um, Carolyn Sissy Adams, Michael Anglin, Freddie Baez, Maximo Centron, Daryl Clayton, Bilal Deshaun Colbert, Stanton Cruz, Darud Culver, Danette Strawberry Daniels, Barry E. DeLoach Sr., Earl Faison, Basia Farrell, Brian Fillmore, Ali Muslim Harris, Sixto Hernandez, Jenny Hightower, Farrell Lee Hoover, Dennis Howard, Abdul Kamal, Warren Lee, Tasha May, 16 years old, pregnant, it was killed in Hillside with a bullet, bullets. Ismail Miranda, Rashid Fuquan Moore, Shaquan Nance, Michael Newkirk, Philip Pinnell, Santiago Chago Villanueva, Antoquan Watson, and Randy Weaver. These are some of them, and I think we need to remember and we need to keep the struggle moving until we get rid of police terrorism, because it is terrorism. Okay, next, up next, for the Family Coalition for Justice, I would like Sheila Reed to come up here. The mother of Jerome Reed. Thank you. Give her a round of applause for coming up here and just show your support, your solidarity. Before I describe the uh, Family Coalition of Justice, I want you to meet my family. Sean Reed. Where you at? Dante, my grandson. Dewan, my other son, my half son. And Larry, my other half son. And Mary, my grandson's girlfriend. This is my family that's here with me today. Unfortunately, my other son, uh, Dwayne, is in Ohio. He couldn't make it. And my other two, uh, my other grandson, uh, I don't know where he is. He didn't make it. But this is my family, y'all. These are the ones that stick by me all the time. I, I can't live without them. And they make sure I'm okay. When I'm down, they right there in my corner. Now, the Family Coalition for Justice is an organization that we had designed for the families of, un of, have, of unarmed victims that's been murdered by the police. Now, if you can join the organization if you want to. If you need to talk to someone, you can contact me. You need my contact information, I'll give it to you. But this is what our coalition is about. The mothers, the families, the fathers, the grandfathers. Because we have handicapped people being murdered by the police. They're being choked out for selling cigarettes. They're being choked out for having um, asthma attacks um, uh, and all sorts of things. They have, a, all, they have a grandmother that has a mental problem. She came out. They put 40 bullets in her. That was unnecessary. So this is the things I'm talking about. We need to stand up. And my main concern of standing for this coalition is for New Jersey to get on the map. We are not recognized. We're not. Our families are not recognized. 
I am not the family of the, the Brown, uh, what's his name? Brown? Michael Brown. His mother is all over. That's because she's with Al Sharpton. And they, they will not come and speak. And there's two other mothers along with them. They will not come to speak to us and help us unless we pay them. I am not here to get paid or get donations or whatever. I'm doing this from my heart. And I need you guys. I need everyone to come out and support us, especially in front of the few, in front of the federal building downtown Newark. Um, on Justice Monday, I believe Justice Monday is what our 89th. Yeah, 89. Our 89th Monday, straight in the cold, in the rain, in the snow. And the wind, the wind even blow us away with the signs, but we come back. We're not going nowhere. We're going to be there until the end. And when it come 100, we're going to probably turn it over some more until we get justice. We need justice, and we want it now. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. And we want it now. Thank you. Power to the people. Power to the people. All right, all right. Up next, we want to bring a leader of a powerful organization. And it is only powerful by the people that he represents. That's here in New Jersey. I want to talk about our chairman. Mr. Lyham, please give a round of applause. Power to the people. I got three minutes. I'm going to yield one minute of my time to the only elected official that's here today. Now, a lot of people knew about this, but there's only one elected official here today, and that's Councilwoman Donna K. Williams from Orange, New Jersey. Give her a big hand. And, and she didn't even ask to speak. She back there holding the flag. I said, you're the only elected official here. You need to say something. Go ahead. Power to the people. So what I will take my time and say that your voice matters. And black lives matter, all lives matter, but you need to make your voice matter on election day. Election day is upon us. November 7th, we'll be electing our next governor for the state of New Jersey. But more important, I am your local elected official in the city of Orange. I'm a council person. And in 2018, while we're standing here in Newark, and there will be local elections here in Newark, there'll be local elections all over. People, I cannot take enough of having 17,000 registered voters, but yet 2,000 people are electing who their leadership should be. That's not acceptable. That means that I can get 2,500 people to write in Donna K. Williams, and I can probably be the mayor of, the freeholder of, and in some cases, the governor of. So people, make your vote count. Get out, uh, make sure you bring 10 people to the vote, to the poll, and make sure the people who we want to represent us, who can write laws in so that these laws can change, so that people can be accountable when people, when police officers shoot persons, it's all about your elected officials. And if you don't have the right elected officials, you're going to keep having the same results. So get out and vote November 7th. And my, vo my heart goes out to the families that are here. I'm with you on Thursdays, with you whenever I can be. This is something that is not acceptable. And um, we have to make change, but we make them first at the polls. Thank you. Power to the people. No justice. No justice. No justice. If there ain't gonna be no justice, stop police brutality. Stop police brutality. Stop police brutality. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you all for coming out today. We're gonna to have other speakers. We're gonna hear from representatives of organizations. 
But just as I pointed out that there was only one elected official here, unless I'm wrong, there's only one pastor of a church here. And this is a problem. Yes, sir. And a lot of you who belong to churches, yes. you got to start talking to your pastors. Yes. Because if the churches would get involved in this struggle, yes, like they did during the civil rights movement, yes, we could do something about police brutality. Yes. We got to get Jesus out from behind the walls of the church and into the street where people are fighting for justice. There's one pastor here, and I know he's here because I spoke at his church last night. And that's Pastor Seth Kepperdale from the Reformed Church in Highland Park. Give him a big hand. You're going to hear from him later. He's a representative of the Green Party, and he's the Green Party candidate for governor. So he will be heard from today. But I just point him out, and look at him. He's a white pastor. And he's here with us. Where are the black pastors? Yeah, where are they? You can't just come out on the issue of black on black crime. You got to come out when the police are shooting down unarmed black people in the street. That's just as bad as black on black crime. Everybody want to talk about black on black crime, but I tell you, even black on black crime is a product of institutional racism. If you had the same socioeconomic conditions in the black community as exists in the white community, you wouldn't have all this crime. We have all this crime because we have astronomical rates of poverty. We have astronomical rates of unemployment. We have substandard health care. We have astronomical rates of mental illness because of the oppressive conditions in our communities. We have astronomical rates of illiteracy. All these conditions exist in the black community and they help produce an outcome of black on black crime. That's why no matter where you go, you can go to Newark, you can go to Chicago, you can go to LA, wherever you go to poor people's communities, you will find high rates of crime. Go to Ireland, where there are poor people, poor working class people, and they got high rates of crime. Crime is the handmaiden of poverty. And this crime situation will continue to exist until we eradicate poverty in the United States. And we must eradicate poverty in the United States. We want an end to police brutality. We want an end to the murder of unarmed people in the streets of America. Since Michael Brown was killed in 2014, more than 2,500 people have been killed by the police in the United States. In 2015, 1,136. In 2016, 1,039. This year, 700. And in our prisons, corrections officers have killed over 800 black people last year in our prisons. That's police brutality too. We got a problem. More people are killed by the police in the United States that were killed in Great Britain in all of the 20th century. Great Britain is a capitalist country. Why, did, why are their police able to deal with the population in a way that doesn't result in massive numbers of people getting killed? Why? Because of institutional racism. Why? Because policing has its origins in the slave system here in the United States. Police as we know them today arose out of the slave patrols. We have this problem of police brutality because this country was founded on brutality. It was founded on murder. It was founded on genocide. This country's history is a wash in the blood of the Native American and the blood of the African. This country wouldn't have the wealth that it had today had not it been for the extermination of the indigenous people and the theft of their land and the enslavement of Africans in the Western Hemisphere for over 500 years. How do you keep a people enslaved? You can only enslave people by the use of the most brutal force imaginable. And this is so 
deep in American society. It's part of the psychosocial fabric of this country. And we have to eliminate police brutality. And we have to fight. We need a movement to stop police brutality, to stop racial profiling, to stop the abuse of people's constitutional rights. And it is going to continue, brothers and sisters, until we change the kind of socioeconomic system that we have. This problem of police brutality is a byproduct of capitalism and imperialism, and it'll continue to exist unless we get rid of it. And it's going to be a long-term struggle. So we fight in the interim for reforms. We fight for police review boards. We fight for body cams and all these other things. We support all those struggles. We fight for the hiring of more minority officers and the promotion of minority and women officers. We fight for those things. But we've been doing these things, and black people and Latinos and poor people continue to die. There has been no abatement. We've seen some abatement here in the city of Newark since the implementation of the consent decree and the placing of a federal monitor over the police department. Maybe every major police department in this country should have a federal monitor and then we'd have some abatement in police brutality. But that's not going to happen. Why is it not going to happen? Because at the bottom of this struggle is a struggle for power. And the people who have power, who have seized control of the government, have been the right wing. Donald Trump was endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan, and then who was he endorsed by? The 338,000 member of the Fraternal Order of Police. That fact cannot be forgotten because the policies regarding policing coming out of the White House are a result of that fact. And who does Donald Trump make the number one law enforcement officer in the United States? The unrepentant, unreconstructive, unreconstituted, racist, arch-segregationist Jeff Sessions, who Dr. King's wife said to the state senate, whatever you do, this man is so racist, don't make him a federal judge. So what does Sessions do? As soon as he's appointed, he says, we're not going to interfere with local police. He says we're not going to implement any more consent decrees. He says we're not going to engage and fight for reform. In, fight, in fact, they want to turn the clock back and make it what it used to be. So we got to get rid of Trump. Getting rid of Trump is part of the fight of ending police brutality. Trump has got to go. I don't care how he goes. Impeachment, resignation, unfit for office, pulled out by his collar, but he has got to go, brothers and sisters. Donald Trump has got to go, and Sessions must go. And that whole white minority regime, what we have in America is a white minority regime. The person who was in the White House did not win the popular vote. He got three million less votes than the person that won the popular vote. He is only there by virtue of the electoral college and institution established during slavery to give the slaveholding states more say in the federal government. So I thank you all for coming out today. I know I've used six minutes instead of three minutes, but this is a question that we must deal with. We must build this movement. We must get justice for Kashad Ashford, justice for Abdul Kamal, justice for Jerome Reed, justice for the McDougal family, justice for Radaz Hearns, justice for all the victims of police brutality. Power to the people. All right, N next up, we have a representative, a brother from the North Community for Accountability Policy. 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 Brother Zaire Muhammad.
Everybody, all power to the people. 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 To the mothers and to the families of everyone who's had to endure this horrible scourge that has been with us for as long as we've been here. You have our, our most heartfelt thanks and support to the fullest. We, some of us have been out here for a long time, and we're going to have to be out here for a long time, unfortunately, because that's the nature of the struggle that we're in. Now, I know some of y'all heard my name and heard some organization that, you know, folks stumble over because you know me and all the stuff that I do over the years. But I should tell you, and everybody got those blue signs, hold them up, right? On this day, there are 30 cities, 30 cities all over this country raising hell around the question of police brutality. And Newark is one of those 30s. But what we need to recognize and appreciate at this historical moment, I'm not talking 1967 or 1947 or 1927, this historical moment, this rally in this town is, has in their hands a civilian review board that has more juice than any other civilian review board that has been implemented to date. But here's the but. There is opposition. Well-paid, well-trained, well-organized opposition. You just heard our brother talk about the Fraternal Order of Police backing Trump to the up team. Well, their local configuration, their union is in court with an injunction to stop our civilian review board from taking its rightful place and doing its rightful work. But the question is whether or not you and me, are we going to accept that? No. 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 Well, that's, that's some real talk and that's some real work to do because there's going to come a time not too long from now, when we may have to go into court to defend that civilian review board, when we have to get in the faces of the police and the unions and the judge and say, yeah, we're here, and we've been fighting for this for over 50 years. And as a point of local self-determination, this is what we want, and this is what we should have, and you need to back up off of it and let it go the way it does it. And if that does it, our struggle is a protracted one. We may have to do some stuff over the long haul on the state level to get that straightened out on, on that front. But in our hands is something that the whole country is looking at. The whole country is looking at Newark to get this right. The whole country. And you know what? I need to make another point, right? Because most of y'all know me from the propaganda work that I do, right? Not only do we have one clergy person here, we only have one elected official here, we only have one person here from the press. We only have one, 30 cities all over the country, people up in arms all over the country, several just had rebellions. Y'all remember Michael Brown in Ferguson, but there was another case just a few weeks ago where a police officer was letting off the hook and folks went off. St. Louis was under fire for several days in a row on top of the people marching, right? right? right. But the press, only one press entity is here on a day like this? And some is wrong on that front too, right? Some right. is definitely wrong on that front. Right. And then finally, I want to acknowledge also what uh, Demo said around the corrections front, right? Because this is, today I have to tell you, is the 81st birthday of Chairman Bobby Seale, the founder of the Black Panther Party, wow. who started 50 years ago on this very front, and we're here, and we're here, we're still here on this front. But we almost lost one of his comrades in prison just a few weeks ago in the state of New York, New York State, oh, straight out of New York City, the most liberal, cosmopolitan area in the world got more political prisoners than any state in the country. Herman Bell, who has been in prison for 45 years, right? Off for parole, how many times, TJ? 
ten times for parole, was savagely attacked by six corrections officers, and this man is 69 years old, getting ready to go for, before the parole board for the 11th time. 69 years old. They almost beat that warrior to death. So this thing that we're up against requires us now, in this moment, to not just be a part of the difference, but to make the difference. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Well, y'all kind of like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I, you know, I ain't feeling y'all. Huh? I'm not feeling y'all. Stop police brutality. 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 By any means. Necessary. By any means. Necessary. By any means. Necessary. By any means. Necessary. Only the people can police the police. Only the people can police the police. All power to the people? In whose streets? 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 So I, you know, I, this, this is a rally, it's supposed to be a march, we're supposed to be raising some hell. I just want to make sure we're in the right place. Y'all all right? Are we in the right place? Are we ready to make some noise? Are we ready to bring some fire to, to power and try and change the game? Are we here to do that today? All right, so I just want to make sure. I'm going to double check you because I got a little list here, right? It's a little sign of the fact Jason was passing it around. I want to make sure I got you on this list because we want everybody's information for the work that we got to do right now in this town to defend our civilian review board. How of y'all hear me? All power to the people. All power to the people. I want you to hold as a wind. I want you to hold November 15th because we're going to have a report back from where we at on this matter real soon. It's going to be right up the street, right there at, at Gallery of Pharaoh. They're opening their doors for us. They have a talk that we call them, where do we go from here? And if you don't know where that title comes from, you got some studying to do. Mm -hmm. Seth Cappadale will tell you that that was one of the greatest books that was ever written. And it was written by one of the greatest ministers that ever walked this walk. I'm, not, I'm talking about none other than Dr. Martin Luther King. And we're still asking that question, where do we go from here? We're raising that question though, around the immediate needs and support of our Civilian Review Board. Y'all all right? Y'all yeah. all right? Y'all yeah. all right? Y'all yeah. ready to march? Y'all yeah. ready to take the streets? Y'all yeah. ready to make some noise? Y'all yeah. ready to raise hell? Yeah. We're going to see all power to the people. All right, thank you, brother, for that. Up next, we're going to bring someone from the American Civil Liberty Union, Dana Huna. Is she here? All right, here she comes. She's making her way up here. I hope I'm out there. Power to the people. Power to the people. I want to take a moment first off to thank all of the families of the victims of police brutality for your strength and your courage to come up here and demand change. Police reform demands much more than just avoiding high profile police killings. Am I right? It demands respect for people's rights, constitutional rights, right. to live free from discrimination, from police brutality, and from abuse of power. And so we have much work to do. It demands transparent mechanisms to make sure that our office are held accountable for their actions. Now, Brother Larry Hamm has come up here and told you why we can't expect change to come from the federal government. We can't expect Donald Trump, a man like Donald Trump to help us, a man who encourages excessive force and then calls it a joke. We can't expect help from a U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions, a man who wants to abandon his federal responsibility to make sure that our officers are not abusing or discriminating, discriminating against our people. But just because we can't expect that change to come from the federal government doesn't mean our fight is over. The fight for accountability 
and justice continues, it doesn't mean we give up. Because the heart of the fight for reform has always been and will always continue to remain with the community demanding for change. And it's because of the power of this community that Newark established its Civilian Complaint Review Board last year. And once fully implemented, that review board has the power to be the strong, one of the strongest, most comprehensive review boards in the country. But still, even after a year, the fight for accountability is not over. The review board has several challenges ahead. It's wrapped up in a, a lawsuit because the police unions are challenging the validity of that review board. But still, we have to make sure that the city does what it needs to do to support the review board and make it a reality. We need to make sure that the city gives the review board the funding it needs to hire staff, to pay for office space, to pay for training, to pay for computers, and to pay for resources that's going to make that review board a reality. And while our, our fight here in Newark continues on, we still have work to do to push for state change, change at the state level. We need a state attorney general who's going to demand that officers keep track of who they're stopping, why they're being stopped, and what happens after they're being stopped. We need to make sure that we have laws that put an end to the senseless war on drugs that has allowed police officers to kill and ruin lives. Now we must not be distracted by claims that everything that we've done thus far is enough. You're good, you can go home now. We can't afford to be distracted by those claims because until we have real, meaningful, lasting change, there will always be work to do. And we will always, always fight until that becomes a reality. Thank you. Power to the people. Get that sister a big round of hall. Up next, I say Black Lives Matter. I say Black Lives Matter. I say Black Lives Matter. Coming up, I have a sister, Shanna Langley, as a representative of Black Lives Matter. Let's give it up. Give a round of applause for this sister here. Come on, this side of here. Power to the people. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. How many more times are we going to have to go on social media and see black death? How many more families are going to have to bear the pain of losing a loved one to census police violence and murder? How many more survivors will have to emerge before something changes? Police brutality and state-sanctioned violence shouldn't be a brutal reality for black people. It shouldn't cut short black life and diminish the chance of having a life that could yield love and joy and protection. We stand here in solidarity today to push back on any looming energy, any entity that threatens to take our lives and irrationally justify it. We push back on feelings of anger and frustration and sadness and remember that we do have the power because we have people power. The trauma that black people face on a daily basis is something that's excruciating. So for that, I want to thank everybody, especially those families that are personally impacted by police brutality, for sharing yourself and your loved one's stories and the essence of their beings as we continue to fight for the humanity of our people. By us being here today, we are reasserting the humanity of black lives, which is stripped by police brutality. By being here today, victims of, and survivors of police brutality won't just be another nameless being that police officers don't have to think about when they go home at night. Despite the racially coded language that permeates police speech and law enforcement institutions, when they talk and think about us, we are humans. Calling us hood rats and thugs proves that the power of the mind influences our actions and their actions show that they do think that we are the criminals and the animals that they call us. The criminal justice system and its agencies throughout this state and this country consider black people to be less than human beings, and that shows up in institutional policies 
and the practices are implemented by law enforcement and it shows up in the cultural and the personal racism that's expressed by police officers? How else do we explain the reasons why we are here in the first place? I want to uplift the, the names of um, Marshall Zamora, his wife Dominique Zamora, as she continues to fight for justice for her husband and also the family of her dad's Hearns. Police brutality is a tool that's used to keep black people in the constant state of fear, to keep us in a state of destitution, a position to be easily exploited. We will continue to show up in these streets and in these courts demanding that those responsible be held accountable for the crime that they are committing against our people because police brutality is a crime. We don't have a legal system that truly holds police accountable for the crimes that they commit. That's why it's no surprise that the police union is trying to block the Civilian Complaint Review Board from being implemented. There is power that has been stripped from our communities for generations, and the CCRB is just a step amongst many that could be taken to put power back into the hands of the people. As we continue this fight, let's always keep the victims and the survivors and their families in our thoughts and in our prayers. And it's the, it's the legacy of, our, of them and our ancestors and our el elders that have prompted us to show up here today to fight for police brutality, and not just today, but every day. I ask that everyone here leans on each other for love and for support, to resist any entity and energy that threatens to extinguish the fire that already exists inside of us, because, like Asada said, we have nothing to lose but our chains. Black Lives Matter, power to the people. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. All Lives Matter. All Lives Matter. Um, I'm actually just going to keep it really short. I always make it a point to say showing up for the work is where it starts. Um, and I just wanted to appreciate everyone for coming out and showing support to these families who are going through something that I could only imagine. Um, that's it, really. I just want to reaffirm that we need to abolish the police. Uh, we got coming up next someone from the I Am Bound Community Corporation, Melissa Miles. Get her around here. Good afternoon, everyone. Power to the people. Power to the people. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. So my name is Melissa, and I work down in the East Ward, down neck for the Ironbound Community Corporation. And I just want to thank People's Organization for Progress um, for allowing me to speak here today. Um, at first, I I was reluctant because I said, well. You know, I've never, I've never suffered like these mothers have suffered, like these fathers have suffered. And so um, what I see now is really that, for me, this is a show of solidarity as a mother. Um, you know, for black people, any day could be our last by, you know, through violence, particularly state-sanctioned violence. Specifically mothers, we never know, especially if we have sons, um, you know, when they will be co-opted by the system to be a part of that violence, whether it be through war. You know, some of you here may have lost family members to war um, overseas, and some of you here have lost family members to war in our communities. When you have police being militarized, you really have nothing short of a war going on on, on streets involving civilians. And um, I really agree with the statements here that the it, it begins with the individual voice, right? Each voice has to understand its own power. Each person has to understand their own power. And we cannot lose to hopelessness, right? Hope is a choice. So we have to continue always with the faith that our prayers will be answered, right? Never underestimate the power of a mother's prayer. Mother's prayers have stopped wars. Mother's prayers have put an end to genocide. Mother's prayers have put an end to violence. It starts in our hearts. And then our voices, which we have to use towards that purpose. So again, thank you to all the family members who stood up here courageously to share so that we, so that people like me can understand. Um, and I, I pray that no other mother has to cry those tears 
those of you who have born children, we, I know we never expect to bury them. We never expect to bury our own children. So those who have suffered that pain deserve the most to see justice done. So I ask you all today to use your voices, to use your votes, right, to not let it end here, to never think that it doesn't involve you. Because an injustice to one is an injustice to all. And I'll end there. Power to the people. All right, give another round of applause, sir. Before our next speaker come up, follow me. I am somebody. 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 On that note. We have the MAPSO Freedom School. TJ Whitaker. All right, thank you. Give this brother a big round of applause. Um, yeah, I'm going to be very brief because I spoke uh, earlier with the families. Um, they asked me to, I wanted, they wanted me to speak about Maps or Freedom School. And so we are um, a group of, of, of radical educators, self-proclaimed radical educators. The only reason why we consider ourselves radical is because the current educational system is absolutely contemptible, right? When it comes to teaching the real truth, um, that's what we see as our obligation. We were born a year ago um, after the incident in Maplewood that I talked about. But one of the things we need to understand, when we talk about our struggle for justice, and we talk about this, for, this demand for justice against police terrorism, there has always been an alternative to what we suffer. In 1964, in Jonesboro, Louisiana, the Deacons for Justice and Defense were born. The Deacons for Defense and Justice were a group of church-going Christians who were tired of the Klan attacking their communities and the Congress of Racial Equality. So what did they do? They began to defend themselves. So on Sundays, they would go to church and pray. And when they came home, they took off the suits and they got their rifles and they defended their communities. In Monroe, North Carolina, the NAACP chapter, led by Robert and Mabel Williams, desegregated the public library. They desegregated the public pool. They also got pardons for two African-American young men who were sentenced to lengthy, lengthy sentences um, in the kissing case, which became international. But what people fail to remember, Robert and Mabel Williams credit self-defense as being a major factor in their victories. People forget and talk about that. The Black Panther Party, exactly, Larry, Negroes with guns. This system has always been afraid when black people decided to stand up and defend themselves. We move on to the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army, right? Further examples of people organizing themselves to defend themselves. They sent shock waves through this system. We have a brother here today, Ojiri Latulo, standing over here in the corner, just give us a shout. 27 year political prisoner right here in New Jersey for standing up and defending the integrity of black people. 27 years as a political prisoner. So the answer is there, all right? I'm not an either or person, I'm an and person. So we need to struggle for the civil complaint review boards like Larry said. And we need to begin to defend ourselves. And if that means defending ourselves against black enemies of black people, so be it. If that means defending ourselves against the police, then so be it. Our work lies ahead of us people, all power to the people. All right, get a brother a round of applause. Okay, next we have a speaker, Seth Capitale. 
Give him a round of applause. Reverend. Right. Hey, That's right. So, power to the people. So, Larry Ham introduced me today as um, Reverend, and and I'm both Reverend and I'm currently candidate for governor with the Green Party, um, and I'm I'm here in both capacities, and I've lost my voice um, through all the talking the last few days, so I apologize for that. But I, I just want to say a few things from my theological tradition because I think I think Larry's absolutely right. There's a big problem when the Sermon on the Mount is the key teaching in our Bible. One of them, it says, Blessed are those who have had the Spirit beaten out of them, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are the meek, for they shall inherit not pie in the sky after they die, but they shall inherit the earth. Faith communities ought to be about transforming this earth, and in particular, faith communities that represent marginalized people, that are filled in their pews with marginalized people, ought to make sure that this earth structurally changes in ways that make it resonate with the beauty of the image of the one in whom we are created. So there's my theological spin on all this today. But I, I want to say, yes, pastor first, that's, that's what I am first. But I want to say today that um, being in this space and listening to the people of New Jersey share about their own losses and the own ways, their, the ways that uh, the people that they love most have been taken from them by the system needs to be something that doesn't just happen here among um, allies, but it needs to become something that resounds and reverberates in other places. I believe one of the ways that we push back in the world is through things like civilian review boards, and the other ways is by being ready to fight, like was just expressed by the last speaker. But another way to fight is by making sure storytelling happens in more places. So maybe we can think about who could be those allies for storytellings. Every Sunday, every Saturday, there are faith communities. Every Friday, there are faith communities of every faith. Every Thursday, too, in other traditions. We've we got many days of the week where we could have faith communities sharing stories about those who have been lost because of police brutality and finding those as new places to find allies. I decided to run for governor because I, every Sunday in my church, either say or live out the message, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And yet I walk out into a New Jersey where the first are first, our first are first. It happens all the time. And I decided that I couldn't just complain about it anymore, but I needed to run for electoral politics because it starts in our electoral system itself and it starts with the wealth that feeds our electoral system that keeps us from having structural change. So that's why I'm running for governor, that the last may be first. Thank you very much. I right, give him a round of applause. Up next... We have someone from the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition, Keisha Yurk. Give her a round of applause. All power to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. Stop police brutality in the black community. Stop police brutality in the black community. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keisha Yuri. I'm the chair for the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition, and I'm excited to be here, and I want to thank People's Organization for Progress for always keeping this on the forefront and never letting us forget that police brutality is alive and well in our community. And so one of the things that I want to say is that we have the Civilian Complaint Review Board that we are forming. And so we're having a little bit of an issue getting it, you know, into fruition so that we can really get some steam going for it. We need the people to start to make some noise around it. So we have organizations that's a part of the review board, but we need the people from the community to start to push the agenda for this review board. So maybe about a couple weeks ago, there was an inspector general from New York, NYPD, who came to Rutgers to talk about um, independent um, review of the police department and we know NYPD has the greatest number of police officers but they have the greatest number of independent review as well and so we were talking about ways to get Newark and get New Jersey into that fold um, we always don't know where the money is coming from so we always trying to find ways to get these things paid for but we should never stop fighting for these things knowing that we need them so police brutality in our community happens when we are outraged because someone gets shot, get killed by the police. And, but then we also go back to sleep 
after it happens. So maybe in the last year, I think I responded to probably about three or four people who were shot by the police. And what do they always say? They had a gun, right? And so that justifies them being able to shoot and kill our people because they say they had a gun. But that's no justification because we know that in other communities, they bring them in alive. They don't bring us in alive when we have um, guns. And so what happened is even recently here in Newark, we had three or four shootings and the families don't get any justice. The families don't even get to go to court. And so how does that happen when we have two Two, what is it, double, what is it, double-sided? When if we shoot and kill someone, we go to jail. They shoot and kill someone, they don't go to jail. They don't even get charged. And all we always ask for is for them to be charged. But we got to start to ask for more than that. And so one of the things, I'm a social worker. And so I have been writing and, and working with Equal Justice USA to train police on how to deal with communities who have been traumatized. So our community deals with trauma. And so if we don't look at our trauma, we don't know that there's trauma, we're going to continue to have business as usual. So we have these trauma trainers, so we bring in police officers and we bring in community, and we talk about trauma that the people experience as a result of police brutality or police presence. And then the police talk about their traumas and what they experience as a result of being in these type of communities. So what we want to come out of the train is that the police become more sensitive to the people that they're dealing with. They know the types of things that people in black communities deal with. And so they never have to deal with that or even learn about it because we don't have any accountability for that. So we need to work on not just this reform we keep talking about, because we know reform is corny, but it's necessary. Uh, but we need to ask for more than just reform. We need some accountability for these police officers. And one of the things that the officer said inside of the training is, when we go to out into the forest and we go out into the streets, one of the things they always say is that we train our people that we just need to go back home. We want to get back home. All the officers say that, right? That we want to get back home. But we say to ourselves, to the people, we want to go home too at the end of the day. How is your life more valuable than mine just because you're law enforcement? And so we have to stop that. We, they kill us on their way home and then they're not going to be charged. But our lives are valuable just as well. So they want to go home at the end of the day. We want to go home at the end of the day as well. And we have to have more accountability. And we're not going to just keep asking for it and asking for it. We have to fight for it. We have to show up to these things. And we have to show up at the city council meetings. We have to show up at the police meetings. We have to show up because they just had a strategic plan that they just put in through and they showed it to us at the last minute where we don't even have any input. So we're going to do our own strategic plan for the reform of the police. But we got to be involved in the process. And because we don't know what the process is, we're not involved. So on behalf of the North Anti-Violence Coalition, I want to thank Pe People's Organization for Progress for always staying on the issue and making us accountable and keeping us accountable so that we can keep the police officers accountable. Thank you. Proud right to the people. Give it a big round of applause. Now I want to, yeah. Now I want to call somebody up, but take a moment before I do that. I just have the question: That do I have to be worried to leave out my front door of being shot? Because one bullet is not enough, and a hundred is one too many. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring up our chairman of the People Organization for Progress, Mr. Larry Ham. Give him a round of applause. I know, I know. Um, we still have a few people left. If if you down for it, I'm down for it. We like to march. If you down for marching, the few who are left here, y'all down? All right, let's get down. <laughs> We're just going to march to uh, Broad Market and back. Uh, so what we want to do is put... Who? Oh, Sister Fuquan, you want to say something real quick? I just want, can you hold that for me? Yes. I just want to thank y'all. Um, I had to get myself together. I'm from Bridgeton, and we got to make this trip back down this highway. And we had a little problems with our lights, so we about to pull up out of here. But I want to thank y'all. This means so much to me. You know what I'm saying? Because we don't get this type of support down Bridgeton. Um, you know what I'm saying? So I need y'all to pray for me. 
you know, I'm going to get this thing together down there because I'm not going to let them just kill my son and get away with it. Right, right. So when I holler for y'all that I need y'all to come down there and see a sister, I'll try to make sure you got a chicken wing or something to go back home with. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm from, I got that southern hospitality type thing. I'm old school. But it, it don't, I'm not going to let them just kill my baby and get away with it. So just pray for us. Pray for us with travel mercy. And we about to get up out of here and hit this highway. But I thank y'all for inviting me. It truly means the world to me. You know what I'm saying? And I done recorded it. And I'm about to go back to Bristol and start some noise. Thank you. Power to the people. All right, we want to take the, uh, somebody carry the Stop Police Brutality banner. Somebody can take that banner. That's going to be the lead banner. No justice. No justice. No justice. If there ain't going to be no justice. If there ain't going to be no justice. No justice. No justice. Stop police brutality. Stop police brutality. Stop police brutality. No justice. 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 What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? Stop police brutality! Stop police brutality! Stop police brutality! What do we want? When do we want it? 